Hi, my name is Heidi. I'm a patient at the Mayo Clinic, and I was diagnosed with a parotid gland tumor and had my parotid gland surgery performed here in 2016. I'm here today with my head and neck surgeon, Dr. Eric Moore, to discuss my patient experience. As a patient who has been through this process, I know firsthand how scary, stressful, and overwhelming it can seem. It is our sincere hope that with these informational videos, we will assist viewers in making decisions about their own medical care, and will also help alleviate some of their fears. So Dr. Moore, thank you so much for being here again today and for dedicating your valuable time to this video project. After probably almost two years of patiently and diligently answering my questions, it's finally your turn to ask me some questions. So what questions do you have for me? Heidi, you've thought so much about this, so I think it's great that you're sharing this with patients because you've done you know, a lot of homework in this subject. Let's talk about finding a skilled head and neck surgeon. I know this was a very important aspect for you and people have a lot of choice. How'd you go about this process? I think I started with doing research on the condition itself and through that process, once I realized like how serious this was and you know that the facial nerve ran through the face and it could be you know complicated surgery, I really wanted to find the best of the best to do my surgery. So um, I really you know made sure that I knew exactly as much as I could with my internet research, knew exactly what the condition was about and then um, sought out several physicians and I interviewed them. And I think, you know, that it's really important for people to do that because through that process, you will learn whether or not that physician is skilled and experienced in handling parotid gland tumors. And that's very, very important. Um, you know, for me, to you have one shot to get this right. And I wanted to get it right the first time because I wanted to minimize the chances of having any complications, any recurrences, and I wanted to maximize my chances of having a positive outcome. And really you do that by finding somebody who's a skilled and experienced surgeon. Share with me some of the questions that you asked people when you interviewed them. What did you think was valid and, and what kinds of things were important to you? I mean, the things that were important is I wanted to know, you know, what is this tumor? How did I get it? Um, what are my surgical options? And then once we got into the surgical options, talking about, okay, how are you going to make the incision and why? Um, what are my, do I need to have reconstruction and what are my reconstruction options? Um, you know, we had a lot of discussion about this condition, Fry syndrome, that mm -hmm. um, occurs after surgery. And I talked to you about, you know, what, what causes that to occur? Is there anything I can do to prevent it? We talked about recovery times, how long it would take for me to be able to go back to my normal life. Um, and, and all of those things were important for me to understand exactly what was going to happen. Okay. And when you got to the consultation, you had a lot of notes that you had yes. taken. Yeah. And uh, uh, tell me about how you thought that was helpful for you. And also, did you think it was important to bring someone with you to the consultation? And how did you prepare yourself for that consultation? I think that, you know, either you should bring someone with you or you should take notes from to record whatever the surgeon is telling you because there's so much information that's being thrown at you and you're not always going to remember what someone's saying to you and it's really nice to have those notes to go back to refer to like what do they say about this again and to the extent that you're interviewing multiple surgeons like I did then you can kind of compare and contrast what they said and then you can make a sound decision about which one is going to provide you the best outcome. And, you know, so I definitely, as I did my research, I would write down questions that came to my mind. And then before I would go to these consultations, I would organize them. And, you know, it helped me determine like what's important to me and people right. have to do that. Right. So I, I do think it's helpful to have those things written down and either write down the answers yourself or bring somebody with you to write them down for you. As surgeons, we're very accustomed to answering these questions over and over and it becomes sometimes very routine and we forget that, you know, this is brand new information, mm -hmm. the situation's emotionally charged and it's sort of an axiom in our field that people probably will forget about 50% yeah. of what's said at least in that consultation. People often ask me if they can record things, which I also think is a great idea. Some way to go back and revisit all that information and remind yourself or, 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 or think of new questions that you might ask. What about being an advocate for yourself uh, in the process? I think absolutely people need to be an advocate and be involved in their own care. And, you know, in this circumstance, as far as I saw it, you know, you're interviewing this surgeon to perform a serv service or a job for you. Right. And you need to ask as many questions as you feel are necessary so that you can make a sound decision about your own care. 
and don't be afraid to ask questions. I think a lot of people are maybe intimidated. Again, it's emotionally charged situation um, and they're too afraid to ask questions. And then, you know, because they don't have those questions answered, they're afraid because they don't know what's going to happen during surgery and it causes a lot of anxiety and fear and i think if you you know have those discussions with your surgeon it really helps you get through that time frame before surgery which those of us who have been through the surgery that is the worst part of it is the time frame leading up to the surgery because once you went through the surgery at least for myself it was not at all what i had built up in my mind it was so much better than what i had built up mm -hmm. in my mind and and, and so it, there's so much relief after the surgery is over because you really do um you know we're our own worst enemy sometimes in terms of scaring ourselves before these things occur and the more information that you have i think the easier it is to get through that process okay what about the diagnostic tests and the surgical plan and uh, sort of laying out what was going to happen? What was important to you in that and what kinds of questions did you have? I had questions about um, what, because I had some diagnostic tests done before I came here and so I had asked about other tests. Are there any other tests that are necessary and is the, will any other tests give you any information that you need um, that you don't already have? So I think if people are concerned or confused about diagnostic test they should ask right. and ask the surgeon why are you ordering this test what is this going to tell you and i think like one of the tests in particular the fine needle aspiration causes people a lot of anxiety right. um, and they don't want to have it done and i think having that discussion and telling your surgeon your concerns and letting them explain to you why they feel the test is necessary and how that might help them develop a surgical plan is important yeah. um you know and i think like knowing the surgical plan for me was extremely helpful because I knew to some extent what to expect and I think like through that process having you lay out the surgical plan also gave me confidence that you know you had the skill and experience that was necessary to perform the surgery so I, I think it's important for people to have those discussions what kind of information when we discussed the surgical plan was important to you what kinds of things relieved your anxiety and what sort of things did you want to know I wanted to know, like, you know, what was the incision going to be? How big was it going to be? How are you going to do it? How was it going to be closed? Um, you know, what potential complications could occur during surgery? Um, you know, I had a fine needle aspiration that came back and said my tumor was benign. But again, you don't know until that final pathology is done um, after the tumor is removed. So even though I knew or suspected it was benign, I still ask you, what's the surgical plan going to be? if this is a malignant tumor because I wanted to know like what you were going to do if they told you this is malignant and so that I would be prepared. Right. As we talked about during your consultation, sometimes those fine needle aspiration biopsies can be incorrect. So they're very reliable most of the time, but you still run into situations where your fine needle aspiration biopsy doesn't tell the whole story. Sometimes a benign initial biopsy doesn't reveal a malignant tumor and vice versa sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I think it is important to have the discussion what's going to happen if uh, the plan changes, the diagnosis changes. And I think like you, you know, I, you had to make a lot of decisions for me. You know, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm under anesthesia, so I right. needed to know, okay, this is what the plan is going to be and exactly what you're going to do. And that gave me confidence that you were going to make the best decisions for me in a mm -hmm. circumstance in which I couldn't make a decision for myself. Mm -hmm. That's a that's what we call the surgical contract. I mean, and ultimately you're trusting that surgeon to make the right decisions for you, just like they would want done for them. And I feel like if you don't have that feeling with your surgeon, you should something's gone wrong right, right. from the get go, and you should probably uh, seek other consultation or discuss the plan further. Correct. You agree with that? I agree. I mean, I think if people don't have that confidence, that they should seek multiple opinions right. um, just to make sure they have to have that. Um, you know, belief in their surgeon that they're going to do the best for them and make the best decisions. And if you have to go see multiple people, so be it. Um, I think it's, you know, it's so important that you get the right person. Right. So the parotid gland is, is this very cosmetically visible area of your face. And, you know, the whole endeavor of the procedure is making the correct diagnosis, taking care of the tumor, be it benign or malignant, getting rid of it appropriately. But there's this issue with what am I going to look like after yeah. the surgery? You know, it's so visible. Everybody's going to look at this every day. So we talked a lot about parotid bed reconstruction, and there's a lot of options. What kinds of things were important to you in that? 
Yeah, uh, as you know, this uh, caused me a lot of angst personally mm -hmm. and probably you a lot of angst as well because I asked you so many questions about <laughs> it. Um, you know, and I think that it's really important that people have those conversations with their surgeon and understand like what factors contribute to what your face is going to look like. So like for instance, you explained to me that, you know, the thickness of your parotid gland could contribute to how much of a dent you're going to have afterwards and that that will factor into the reconstruction um, decision and you know that's not something that I knew beforehand um, so I think people should talk know how much of the gland is going to be removed um, you know you I think relying on the expertise and the experience of their surgeon which is what I had to do and that helped me make my decision because you know you told me that in your experience for me personally that I didn't need reconstruction and you explained to me the reasons why um, we did have a conversation about what the options would be if I wanted to have reconstruction and you told me what the best option was in your view and also explained to me the reasons why. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really helpful in, in making that decision so that I could have all the facts in front of me and then look at that and say, okay, I'm, you know, either I'm not going to do reconstruction, I am, and here's the type I'm going to do. Right. So the parotid gland, uh, we always talk about is about as thick as the palm of your hand, mm -hmm. and sometimes we're taking out part of the parotid gland, at which point probably no real significant reconstruction needs to be done. Sometimes we're taking out the entire thickness of that gland based on where the tumor is or what type it is, and then sometimes we do fill in that bed so that it looks more symmetric and mm -hmm. even in the face. And there's different ways to do that, and some of those ways we say work better in some people's hands, and other things might work better in another person's hands. So having that discussion up front, discussing what the pros and cons are, when reconstruction would be done, I, I think, like you said, really helps relieve anxiety before the procedure and lets you know uh, what's going to happen, what it's going to look like afterwards. Yeah, and I think with reconstruction, my thought was is that that was somehow going to prevent Fry syndrome from developing. And, and right. we had this conversation that, you know, I was pretty much of the belief that, okay, well, I'm going to do reconstruction to prevent that. And you told me that that was not reliable in achieving that goal. And I think a lot of people do think that if they have reconstruction, that's going to prevent that, that syndrome from developing. Right. My view is that Fry syndrome happens to a whole lot of people with or without that reconstruction, mm -hmm. that those nerves are very resilient and good at finding a way back into place and, and causing Fry syndrome, which is that sweating that you sometimes get when you first start to eat. And so being prepared for that, I think, is necessary because I think that actually there are no surefire ways that you can absolutely prevent Fry syndrome. So knowing that, you know, that wasn't a mistake that wasn't a bad decision that I right. made regarding reconstruction I think is important yeah. um, you and I've had a lot of discussions regarding what is the recovery time after parotidectomy and I've come to learn from a lot of these discussions that the recovery time that I think of is very different sometimes than the recovery time that a patient uh, might experience so tell me about what the recovery time period is like for you and uh, sort of the important things that were helpful or you think would be helpful for people to know after going through your experience I think it's important for people to know that it's longer than seven to ten days, which is the mm -hmm. standard answer that um, a lot of physicians will give. And we've had this conversation on other videos as mm -hmm. to why that is, um, and just a disconnect between how surgeons will explain something versus how you know a patient views it. So I think that. Um, you know, definitely days three, four, and five were the worst for the swelling, um, and then it progressively got better. Everybody's going to be different, so everybody's pain level is different, everybody heals differently. So um, I think that if you're going through something, you need to ask your surgeon about it. If you're bothered by something, if you're worried about something, have a plan in place. Um, people should know what a normal side effect is mm -hmm. versus what something that is a complication that will require them to need medical care and i you know i had those discussions with you before my surgery so i knew if i saw something whether that was normal or if i needed to go to an er or do something or contact you mm -hmm. and i think it's important for people to know that and i think that you know for me i would say around the six month mark i started to feel like mostly normal um, but it took a good year to feel totally normal because your face is still going to be numb and it takes time to resolve it to, you know for some people it takes time for the nerves to regenerate where did you feel most of the numbness i mean the numbness was you know right here for the most part mm -hmm. um and um maybe like 
the corner of my face around my ear and the ear itself. So, but then I could slowly feel that coming back. And, you know, sometimes people have like shooting pains and the nerves regenerating that you can feel. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's not a normal thing. So I wouldn't say I was fully recovered at six months because I still had numbness and I had some of those, I guess they call them zingers and things like that where your nerves are regenerating. Mm -hmm. But at the one year mark, I think I pretty much felt like I was back to normal. I, you know, I'm now I can feel my entire ear. I can feel my face, um, you know, and so I, I felt like it was much longer than a lot of people anticipate and it requires patience for people to realize that you're not just going to be recovered in a couple of weeks it's going to take time mm -hmm. and but you will recover and that's the you know that's the great thing about it as hard as it was to get through the surgery people will recover but that's a that's a really important point i think is that a year later you were still experiencing yes. things from the surgery, and I wouldn't consider that you had a complicated or a particularly unusual surgery, but it's, it's, it's much more than people think. Yes, absolutely. And, and you're right, people are gonna get through it, and most of the time it's gonna turn out with a very good outcome, but they're always gonna have some memory and some yes. marks of having undergone that surgery. Absolutely. And I don't think yeah. everybody anticipates that. They don't. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, having those discussions early on with your surgeon is important because it helps you set up realistic expectations mm -hmm. and also helps your family set up realistic expectations. Because I think, you know, a lot of times mm -hmm. if you're told, OK, you'll be fine in seven to 10 days then everyone expects you to be fine in seven to 10 days. Right. And that's not the case. And so then it, you know, causes some anger and frustration when that doesn't happen. You're not magically like, oh, I feel great in 10 days. Um, so it is important to have those realistic expectations. One of the most common questions that I get in along these lines is, when should I go back to work? And that's a, a really difficult thing to answer because it's a different question for almost every single person as far as what they do, how urgent it is that they get back to that, how much time they can take off. But what were some of your just overall feelings of when you felt well enough to get back to some semblance of daily life? I think that um, standard, if people can do it, three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, that's what I took two weeks and I tried to go back to work. Um, it didn't work out that great. So I ended up having to take um, another week off. And, and what I, kinds of things were difficult for you at that point? Um, you know, I think it was just like, you don't feel great. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had, you know, like a lot of like weakness, like you don't feel like yourself or strong enough. And it right. was hard to like, you're tired. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that fatigue really makes it hard to get through the day. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for some people, it's hard to turn their head or their neck, depending on where the incision was. So, you know, there's just a lot of things that you don't think about until this happens that you're like, this is a part of your face you know your face that you use every day and it's it's just um you know that I think the fatigue for me was really shocking and um you know I did not feel close to like getting on the track to being normal until like a month after surgery I think okay so we um think about the post-operative appointment as being important because it's a good time to sort of relay information and talk about what happened. There's not often a lot as a surgeon that I physically do uh, mm -hmm. with the incision or things like that in the post-operative appointment, but there's still a lot of important discussion that happens. What did you do to prepare for the post-operative appointment and what was important for you? I read the operative report. Mm -hmm. um, I also read the final pathology report. And, um, you know, to the extent that anything was going on with my recovery, I think, you know, I had already contacted you about that, but I would certainly write things mm -hmm. down um, as I thought of them. But reading that operative report and the final pathology report was really important because there were certain things in there that I wanted to clarify and I wanted you to explain to me. And there were some medical terms that I was like, what is this and what is that? Um, so that I clearly understood what had happened during my surgery and then also what the final pathology meant. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for people to know that. And okay. it also decreases some of the anxiety. Like if you don't understand what the final pathology is, you know, people are going to be worried, you know, did they get everything? Is this, you know, going to come back? That kind of thing. And mm -hmm. if you have those discussions, then that alleviates some of those worries. Yeah. Fortunately, a lot of these parotid tumors are 
benign non-cancerous tumors, so removing them is the only complete tumor treatment that needs to be done, but that's a very important point. Was it totally removed? Was anything left behind? Is it one of these tumors that has a higher or a very low potential to recur? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is contained in that pathology report. Mm -hmm. The pathology of the tumor dictates so much of that, so understanding that really well is important. All right, what about the emotional support around the time of the surgery? What do you think was important for you and what's important for patients? I definitely recommend that people join a support group um, of people who have this condition and who mm -hmm. have been through this process because um, it's really hard to explain to people who haven't been through the process um, you know, how scary it is to have a, a prospect in which you either have cancer potentially in your head and your neck or the potential for facial paralysis. And I think like only the people who have actually been through it can truly understand that. Um, and just, you know, they can also explain to you different things about the surgery. And I think it's also good to be in these groups to see people who have come through the surgery just fine, um, face is not paralyzed, and um, can kind of talk to you and say, everything's gonna be okay. And um, that emotional support, I think, is really important. Because even if you have a supportive family and friends, which luckily I did, um, you know, I, they can't truly understand exactly mm -hmm. what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And and although we try to do a whole lot as a physician to explain everything and, and reassure people, it's still not the same as somebody who's actually been through the process, no. right? validating it and showing you what's going to happen and, and that you can come out the other side okay. Yeah, because I think like, you know, you're in there performing the surgery all the time, but you haven't had the surgery. Okay. So I think that the, you know, so I think that your surgeon is probably like the next likely person who can understand the circumstance, but still they haven't been through the surgery either. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think those support groups are really important for that reason. Do you have any messages for family members of patients who are going through surgery uh, that you would like to share? Yes, um, patience is required by everyone. And, and just to understand that it's a highly stressful and emotional journey for the patient just because there's so much at stake. And there's, again, you know, it's your face. It's an area that you can't hide this treatment area. And people are so afraid that their face is going to be paralyzed. And, um, you know, so that's what I think makes it so emotional. And that, you know, um, you know, but I think patients also have to understand that's probably scary for their family too. Mm -hmm. And so as much information as you can gather from your surgeon and, you know, kind of share that with your family, I think it, you know, helps everyone understand what's going to happen and, you know, also to know the plan and to know what the realistic recovery is so that everybody's prepared. And I think that'll help your family or go a long way in doing that. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of patients who, um, know they have a parotid tumor, know they need to do something about it, but it's just very difficult to bring themselves to the idea that I, I have to do this, I have to have surgery. What kinds of things do really you think were helpful for you uh, on the decision to eventually have surgery? I wish there was something that easily helped me make that decision, but you know, the truth is, is that, that um, there was nothing easy about mm -hmm. this process. So I think that, um, there's a lot of ups and downs and I understand the concept of not wanting to do something because I remember in the early days of diagnosis even thinking that for you know just a few moments like you know do I really need to do something about this like I don't, I don't want to have to go through the surgery um, but at the end of the day it came down to after doing research and having discussions with you there was in my view there was no choice but to have the surgery because unless I wanted to allow this tumor to grow and continue to cause problems and then make the surgery more complicated and risky down the road or if I was willing to risk um, you know the, the chance that this could potentially be malignant tumor and that um, you know I'm just letting this malignant tumor sit in my face it, it's definitely something I was like I didn't have a choice like I had to have this removed and really thinking about it if I would have had the, if I would have made the decision to not remove it it's not like that would have brought me any relief because right. I still know it's there I know that I have to deal with this at some point now I know that I'm just making it more complicated and I'm just kicking the can down the road and for something that I'm gonna have to deal with anyway so I just felt like it was the best and the right 
thing to do to get this removed as soon as I knew, you know, exactly what my diagnosis was. I think that's the probably most important public service announcement is that <laughs> it doesn't make it better to wait. And, and yeah. ordinarily, it usually makes it worse to have it grow and get bigger. So ultimately, mustering up the courage and doing something about it is the right thing to do because almost never do we tell people, well, that's okay. Just sit on that. It's a benign tumor. It's not going to do anything harmful. Yeah, and I think it's just that everybody should know that everything's going to be okay in the end. Like, there's going to be many yeah. times where you feel like it's not going to be okay, but it will be because the vast majority of these tumors are benign. Uh, the vast majority of, you know, the surgeries go extremely well, and people recover, and they move on with their life. And if you select, you know, again, go back to that fundamental decision. If you select a head and neck surgeon who is skilled and experienced, they're going to provide you with the best possible outcome, and that's the best thing that you can do for yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you for sharing your, yeah, your sure. information, Heidi. You've thought a lot about this, and I think you have a lot of important messages uh, that are going to help a lot of people. So thanks for sharing it. Yeah, thank you.